political commentator and investigative journalist. You're with Patrick Henningsen on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. Welcome back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to TNT Today's News Talk. This is the Patrick Henningsen Show live and direct for the next two hours. Thank you for joining us on Monday. Big hello to everybody in the TNT chat community. We see we've migrated uh, a few of our loyal listeners from the earlier time slot uh, into this later schedule. Great to see you guys there. Appreciate you, especially you guys in Europe. You're staying later. Uh, you're staying up a lot later than what is normal, or maybe you're up this late. Uh, if you're on the continent, you probably are. If you're in the UK, we appreciate your listenership. You're an important part of our tapestry of listeners and viewers now on TNT. Now, I want to switch gears right now, going international. And I want to connect uh, right now onto the call uh, a great geopolitical analyst and political commentator. His name is Benjamin Rubenstein. He's been on the program before. And uh, Ben, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Patrick. Glad to be here. I'm glad uh, glad you could make it, Ben. And a lot of U.S. journalists were up very early this morning, so 3, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., uh, to catch the kickoff at The Hague. The International Courts of Justice has gone into gear just to add another <laughs> big event um, to the Monday uh, trifecta, uh, which we mentioned before. Um, I want to hear your commentary on this because I know it's important uh, to see what progress is being made on that front. Uh, but, uh, yeah, just if you had a an opportunity to uh, to see that case and tell us why it's so crucial. Well, it's a bit more than a trifecta. The end of Ramadan is tomorrow, so it is sort mm. of a colliding of many different things. But absolutely, I've definitely taken a look at the case. And, you know, Nicaragua, they have a, a large Palestinian and Arab community. They, they've for decades supported the Palestinian cause and they were eager to eager to take a stand for Palestine today at the court of justice. Notably, one thing that really stood out to me and something that Nicaragua has been quite firm in is that Palestinians have a right to armed resistance. Now, this is something their lawyer actually said and it is enshrined by a UN charter. Not only that, but they, they seem to be confused as to why Germany, quote, can't tell the difference between self-defense and genocide. So they were really not pulling any punches here. And it's further interesting to note that a lot of people speculate that the ICJ doesn't really have a huge uh, impact on things. But one thing that is historically important is that Nicaragua has actually won a court case in the ICJ before against the United States when the United States basically ran paramilitaries uh, called the Contras, and they won this case in the 1980s and were awarded $17 billion in reparations, which the United States never paid. But of course, this precedent is on the minds of, of Nicaraguans as as they launch this court case. And, you know, the support for the Palestinian cause here is quite significant. There's a new highway or a main road that goes straight through the center of the capital called Pista Gaza. There's a new Palestine, Parque Palestina, which is Palestinian park that was just inaugurated a few months ago. So it's something they take quite seriously, Patrick. Yeah, the, uh, the, there's a number of Latin American countries, Ben, uh, which you're aware of, Cuba being like the most obvious champion of the Palestinian cause traditionally over the years. But Chile has a massive uh, diaspora Palestinian community uh, in Santiago uh, as well. So that, that's a very important international issue for a number of uh, Latin American uh, countries. Venezuela as well. It's worth noting that Hugo Chavez was considered one of Pal the Palestinian resistance's greatest supporters for a long time. And relations with Venezuela and Israel are practically non-existent for that reason. But the Venezuelan government to this day under President Nicolas Maduro continues to be diehard supporters of Palestine as well. And, you know, for what it's worth, almost all of these countries in Latin America and sort of the socialist countries that really stand out in Latin America don't call for a complete dissolution of the Israeli state. What they do call for is a Palestinian state with the capital of East Jerusalem and recognized by the sort of 1967 borders, which coincidentally is what the Palestinian resistance also calls for. 
So back to the ICJ uh, case here, and um, they're, they're, they're really attacking Germany's uh, military support um, for Israel. And I think this is important. The argument that the Germans are making is that, hey, you know, we're, we're just supplying them uh, uh, ammunition, uh, shells, tank shells, for instance. Um, but, you know, we're not actually fire. We're not responsible for what Israel does once they receive those. Um, and the argument that Nicaragua is making is that you, you can't opt out on that argument. Basically, it's no different than you firing uh, from German tanks yourself. You're, you're fully aware of what the results of those uh, ammunitions are going to be, uh, based on the devastation that we all have uh, witnessed over the last six months. So they're really going for this, this arms supply thing. Why this is important, because if there's any traction on this argument, this can apply to every other country that's supplying weapons and arms to Israel, most notably the United States, but not only the U.S. You've got Britain, you've got France, you've got Spain, You've got a number of European countries that are actively um, aiding and abetting uh, the uh, Israeli government uh, in what they're doing in Gaza. So uh, I think I, a lot a lot of people have lost uh, hope in international justice from the ICC, obvious and, and for good reason, by the way, the ICC. But the ICJ, um, it's it still is working here. There's a process. It's slow. It's a long process, Ben but it's still working. Uh, what happens if uh, next, by the way, and then what can happen if they, if they do get traction on this specific argument? Well, first off, I'd like to say that Germany's defense of, oh, we're just supplying the bullets doesn't really resonate with me as an anti-Zionist Jew uh, and as somebody who lives in Nicaragua. You know, when I think of that, when I th hear that excuse, I, I sort of think of drug dealers, right? When when you, someone dies from a fentanyl overdose, yes, you you arrest the drug dealer, sure, but you also go after their supplier. And if you don't do that, they're just going to find another drug dealer. So it's the same thing to me. If you don't go to the root of the issue, you're really not going to have any meaningful results. And those overdoses or that this genocide will continue uh, unabetted. So I really do hope that, you know, the, the case rules in Nicaragua's favor. I think not only does Nicaragua have a precedent of winning ICJ cases, but Germany is no stranger to genocide. They've been committing genocide for well over 100 years. N the Namibian genocide, uh, which killed over 100,000 people and the Holocaust itself. So when Germany says, in the ICJ case today, oh, you know, we've done everything to repent for the Shoah. Well, they have done virtually nothing to repent for the, the Namibian genocide. And from my view, as a Jewish anti-Zionist, I don't see sending Israel 30 to 48 percent of its military equipment, of its arms, as a, some sort of repentance for genocide. How can you repent for genocide by aiding and abetting and colluding for another genocide? It just doesn't make sense. In fact, I think that that sort of line of thinking that they've come out with is incredibly insulting and offensive because it's, it's in some ways it's anti-Semitic. Basically, they're saying, listen, we can repent for killing all the Jews or almost all the Jews by killing all the Palestinians as if that's what Jewish people want, when in reality is just what Zionist supremacists want. So, you know, these things are very different and Germany not being able to differentiate between the two, not being able to differentiate between self-defense and genocide, as Nicaragua says, is sort of par for the course for the German state. And uh, you're not the first person to bring this up, uh, Ben. I think the uh, great uh, Middle East geopolitical scholar, uh, Tariq Cyril Ammar, made this very argument uh, on our other program, um, basically saying that uh, the Germans are trying to atone for the guilt of the Holocaust right down to the last Palestinian. And, and, and exactly. This, this and, you is, know, personally, me, yeah, I've never ahead. seen a penny. I've never seen a penny of reparations from the German state. So, you know, I you know, I, I didn't grow up a, as a wealthy Jew, as some, you know, some people think Jews have all the money. That's not always the case. And I do think in some ways Zionism is a class thing. So, you know, these reparations are definitely not going to Jews like me, everyday working class Jews like myself who who aren't attached to a sort of genocidal entity. 
Yeah, and, and, and it, there is a class dimension to it, and that uh, you can make that argument because it's borne out in sort of international non-aligned movement and the international socialist movement support for the Palestinian cause, which is pretty clear uh, for a number of decades. So that's a very strong argument, in fact. But um, uh, on that front, though, with with Germany, you could you can also say the fact the, the symbolism of a small country like Nicaragua, relatively poor country, a country that has embattled has been through u.s regime change operations uh civil wars dirty wars for decades and is now taking more than the that. stand more than that taking the stand on the international stage going after effectively a world superpower in germany and so the the fact that germany hasn't hasn't learned these lessons from the past it's this is like the ultimate failure of an advanced western economic power an advanced liberal western civilization this is germany is the epitome of this in the, in the post world war ii era and it doesn't seem to have learned its lessons of history here with its unflagging support of uh, netanyahu and the uh, the israeli regime when clearly there's a war crimes going on here benjamin so um th this is kind of a, a is, is a bit of an epic tale here i think a bit of a, a bit of a an allegory really Absolutely. You know, as you said, Nicaragua is, in fact, a very small country. There's a famous song here, which translates basically to little Nicaragua, but despite its size and its the size of its population as well, it often does punch above its weight class. And this is due to, uh, you know, just uh, world class diplomats, really, really world class diplomats. And for that reason, not only in the past with the Contras, with a literal a US president over a century ago, uh, and in 2018, when the U.S. tried to overthrow their government through sponsoring these sort of um, tronques where they set up roadblocks and committed terrorism throughout the country, uh, despite all this, Nicaragua has always come out on top. And they're, they've been on the rebound since 2018 as a result when, you know, these same opposition forces in Nicaragua who are now exiled are actually very much supportive of Israel and the genocide going on, uh, they they basically consider the the Nicaraguan government as allies to Hamas terrorists, which of course they are allies to freedom fighters. But this is not the sort of the the opposite. This is the view of the opposition which the U.S. tried to install. Uh, not not even that long ago, that lives on very much in the minds of Nicaraguans. So again, Nicaragua is taking a stance, and it's worth noting that Germany actually has a presence here. One of the top pre-university schools in the country is a German school. They teach German. There is German economic ties here. But despite all that, despite the money, Nicaragua is saying, listen, this is unacceptable. What you guys are doing is you're, you're helping basically kill chil women and children, uh, you know, with, with zero regard for civilian life. It's absolutely appalling. And so I am personally very proud to call Nicaragua my home. Uh, and, you know, that is why I'm wearing a red and black kafia right now, because because that uh, I think that says it all. You know, the FSLN led by Commandante Daniel Ortega has always supported the Palestinian cause and the and other forces in this country would not uh you know have the same moral clarity as the fsla and you're pointing out some interesting uh things there you know if you look at uh the coup against uh evo morales uh in bolivia a couple of years ago this sort of right-wing element was very pro-zionist um you also have the current uh, president um in argentina which has been feted by the west uh, as a, quote, libertarian, uh, uh, Javier Millet, uh, a complete arch Zionist, in fact, flew right over there to give his seal of approval uh, to Netanyahu to to slaughter more Palestinians in Gaza. I know that sounds overly dramatic, but that's the way the optics look. I'm sorry. You know, and and not, and also um, in Brazil, uh, in Brazil, the, the, the hard right in Brazil, extremely pro-Israeli. And, and very open about it. So it's interesting, how, Ben, what I'm saying is it's interesting how this issue is internationalized, and especially in South America, I, in Latin America. I find that to be fascinating. I don't know if you have any further thoughts on that. 
Well, I think I think you 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 hit the nail on the head, Patrick. The right wing forces throughout Latin America have uh, a sort of continuity in terms of certain ideolo- uh, ideological positions. Capitalism being one of them, but another one, interestingly enough, is evangelicalism. the The church, the Catholic Church here, it, throughout Latin America, has significant influence, even in Nicaragua. And as well in other countries in Latin America, you will see Star of David Israeli flags all over the place. Now, this is not because the average lay member of the church supports the Israeli genocide on Palestine. It is because the leaders of the church support the Israeli genocide on Palestine. And these leaders are, of course, moneyed individuals who have ties to sort of the oligarchs. Now in Nicaragua, you're talking about the Chamorros. In Bolivia, it would be another group in Argentina, another and elsewhere. So I think that there's definitely an undercurrent that's happening here. And one interesting thing I'd like to point out real quick, is that recently there was a, uh, a, a talk at a think tank, and the name of the think tank is eluding me at the moment. But in this photo were numerous U.S. defense officials, uh, Masi Alinejad, who is sort of a uh, uh, voice of America, Iranian exile, uh, who, who got caught lying about the death of Masa Amini uh, in, in order to spark a color revolution in Iran. And now this is interesting because Masi Alinejad is actually a hardcore Zionist as well. She's given talks in Beverly Hills synagogues, to give you an idea. And right beside Masi uh, Alinejad was um, Felix Maradiega, who is a Nicaraguan exile who basically... Uh, you know, contributed to and was involved in terrorist activities in Nicaragua in 2018, and also tried to run for president while, you know, laundering money for the U.S. State Department. So, you know, all these sort of uh, right wing opposition groups, whether it be in Iran, whether it be in Latin America, are very much connected. And I believe in my personal view that underlying current, the thing that connects them all is often the United States State Department. Yeah, and also Colombia, the, uh, par- the the paras in Colombia, uh, and the IDF links uh, to to those groups as well as the drug, as well as the drug trafficking, by the way, that does actually have a route directly to Tel Aviv and uh, Israeli youth, uh, if you look at the global league tables, very high a percentage of recreational drug use um, in Israel, as well as other European countries, is is on par with some of the the leading European countries in that in that sense. But it's interesting how all of this fits together, Ben. And a lot of people don't like to do the analysis on this, but a lot of these things are not coincidences, um, is what we're saying. Um, you do have significant operations from uh, overseas countries right throughout Latin America, uh, and they and they do connect to the drug trade um, as well as arms trafficking and and other human trafficking and other illicit. Uh, trades going on globally. So, and again, that also stretches to the United States, of course. So this is obviously an uncomfortable conversation on many different fronts. But uh, it's interesting that um, the the Israel is kind of there, you know, in the frame um, on a lot of these things. So uh, certainly it's worthy of a little more uh, investigation. So uh, we're here with Benjamin Rubenstein. We're talking about, uh, among other things, the ICJ uh, case uh, early hours this morning. And before we go to break, Ben, I hope you can stay on the other side uh, for some additional commentary. But the New York Times was weighing in on the ICJ case. And it's interesting. The New York Times, the paper of record, what do they talk about? Halfway down the article, Nicaragua's government itself is facing sanctions for repressive policies at home. A United States, a United Nations special report uh, said the government's numerous abuses include jailing and deportation of opposition figures, as well as Roman Catholic clerics tantamount to crimes against humanity. So the New York Times is trying to equalize the potential war crimes here that Germany is involved in backing an active genocide. Uh, in Gaza to something that Nicaragua's uh, somehow hamstrung with here. What, what, what would you say to this uh, caveat by the uh, New York Times? You know, I think it's disgusting. First of all, Nicaragua 
is, uh, you know, I living here in Nicaragua, I feel far more free than I did living in the United States. And I will say that there has been, you know, uh, uh, priests and bishops locked up. I documented one myself in Matagalpa not so long ago, maybe about two years ago. Uh, a, a bishop by the name of Alvarez was arrested. And this happened because he took to his seven radio stations and tried and called for his supporters to uh, uh, basically try to overthrow the government. And not only that, but Bishop Alvarez's church in Matagalpa, uh, before he was imprisoned and subsequently exiled, has actual members of the FSLN itself. So when I tell you that this is coming from the top of the Catholic Church and not from the bottom and how, you know, there is no repression against the Catholic Church or church members here. So when I hear human rights abuses, it doesn't make sense. I was in Matagalpa as Bishop Alvarez was being put under house arrest. And I personally witnessed churchgoers going up and down the street. I have videos on my Twitter account. You can check it out of people going house to house worshiping the Virgin Mary, singing songs, and, and, and practicing their religion freely and openly. At the same time, there was a massive disinformation campaign happening about Matagapa, where people were saying it, publishing videos of, of riots in the streets, people going into churches and destroying them. None of that was true. I saw those, and that's why I, those, those, that fake news, and that's why I went to Matagapa to see what was going on, and it was completely calm. So 95, 99, or even 100% of the, the quote unquote human rights abuses that people accuse Nicaragua was are, are, are literally just fake news. You know, Nicaragua puts uh, almost all of its resources into helping its people. There's no homeless people here. You know, in the United States, you can't go, you know, five blocks in the capital city without seeing a homeless encampment. In the meantime, Nicaragua being one of the poorest countries in the hemisphere has virtually no homeless people. I have seen maybe three homeless people in the entire almost three years that I've lived here, right? There's jobs, there's housing assistance. Uh, you know, people get, families with no money for school supplies get school supplies supplied to them by the Ministry of Education, excuse, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so, you know, health care is free. <laughs> you know, you can practice your religion, religion freely. You can do your business freely. Uh, so, you know, these accusations are just completely unfounded. Human rights abuses in Nicaragua, it doesn't happen. If somebody's locked up, it's because they tried to overthrow their government. Yeah, and I might also add that despite the fact that uh, countries like Nicaragua, and they're not uh, alone in this respect in Latin America, uh, there's a lot of community mobilization uh, to help people who are less fortunate as well. There's a big charity element, and also the church is part of that charity support network as well. So this doesn't get talked about. These are all things that they used to have in the United States years ago, but not so much, uh, not so much anymore. I'm with Ben Rubenstein. We're going to take a short break uh, with TN today's news talk and when we come back we'll discuss other international issues uh including uh the issue of israel and the biden administration is has this become an anvil around the ankle of the democratic party we'll talk about that after these messages we'll be right back i was such a young age everything changed my name is chloe when i was 13 my dad was diagnosed with cancer when i found out I just didn't know how to react. I felt like everything was just kind of closing in on me. It just became a routine. Dad's doing chemo. I'd come home from school, wait for mum to finish work, and we'd go straight to the hospital, spend a few hours there, just draw. It was hard to navigate going to school. Hundreds of kids, and I was the only one with a dying dad. He was diagnosed in March, and then he died in October. Towards the end, I heard about canteen. It kind of felt nice to know that they had other people like me. They understood what I was going through and we didn't even have to chat about cancer. In 2020, I became a youth ambassador so I can help others the way they helped me. I've done so many things since I was 13. I've graduated high school, university, gotten my license, made a move across the country. Life now is just a whole lot more fun. Please give a gift today to support more young people like me experiencing cancer. 
You're with Patrick Henningsen on today's News Talk Radio, TNT. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the program. I'm Patrick Henningsen, your host. We're here in the final segment of the first hour. We're live and direct on TNT. Today's News Talk, very pleased to be joined by Benjamin Rubenstein. He is a political commentator and also a geopolitical analyst based in Latin America. He's talking to us on the line right now about the ICJ case. And just to wrap up that point, Ben, is that South Africa, when they initially brought this uh, case for uh, an emergency consideration that uh, to to kickstart an investigation. So my understanding is there is now an ongoing investigation. Evidence is constantly accumulating. Israel has done nothing um, to sort of pause or slow down in the immediate uh, aftermath of the initial uh, South African filing. Uh, they also petitioned, did South Africa, um, about the hunger uh, in the imminent uh, crisis, the famine crisis, there obtained a, another ruling which ordered Israel to permit the delivery of food, water, and other vital supplies without delay, which they didn't do. They delayed. And only now, Ben, only now, this week, has the dial moved on this issue. And what moved the dial? What moved the dial? Seven aid workers, m the majority of which were Western, British, American, uh, European, there are a few others in there, Polish. Um, and then all of a sudden, it became a crisis. The World Central Kitchen, fronted by the celebrity chef, uh, uh, I think Jose Andreas, I believe his name is, I'm not sure, I forgot his name. But uh, it, so this is a high profile, high flying NGO. And they were tasked to sort of come in on this pontoon pier that the United States military is constructing to bring aid in. None of this makes sense to us, Ben, because we've been watching this thing from the beginning. We know that there's hundreds of lorries backed up at the Rafa crossing. All they have to do is let them in. And Israel has the power to let them in because they're the ones checking all the deliveries. Okay, a lot of people are blaming Egypt exclusively for this. I don't think that's correct. I think this is also Israel has the final say as to what gets in and what doesn't because they're militarily occupying these uh, key nodes and checkpoints uh, in Gaza. Just just what's your what are your thoughts on this whole world central kitchen? How, how are you looking at this in the sort of wider scheme of things? Well, I think really what it comes down to is that it, it's indicative of sort of the pettiness of what is the supremacy of Zionism. And I say that because, you know, they say we don't have, oh, we made a mistake. We accidentally killed these seven workers in three different locations where we bombed them. And somehow they expect people to believe that was a mistake. When in reality, Israel spends four times uh, per capita on uh, on military equipment and and such as the United States. Israel's one of Israel's top exports is actually intelligence and and sort of electronic warfare associated things, drones, surveillance, spy tech, all of that. They are supposed to be the best in the world. There are people, there are, uh, you know, Israeli officials who have bragged about being able to see the check mark on a Nike shoe, yet somehow they couldn't see the logo on the top of a car designating the World Central Kitchen. No, it doesn't float. Not only that, but they have an AI called Lavender, which helps them target suspected Hamas people. And they kill people and they, they say, okay, you know what? There's a Hamas target, a suspected Hamas target here. And they're surrounded by 20 civilians. Let's kill them. Let's kill all these civilians for this maybe Hamas target. And, you know, going back to what I mentioned regarding the pettiness, Chef Jose Andreas actually posted a video on Twitter where he himself speculated that it may have happened because he had made tweets critical of Netanyahu. He actually said that he suspects it could have been retaliation for his tweets. And so at the same time, you have all this excuse making. You have the U.S. allowing Israel to investigate itself and reviewing the results. But the U.S. knows better than anybody besides maybe Palestinians themselves the amount of accuracy and pinpoint technology that Israel has. So. What it comes down to is it was done intentionally. It was very obviously done intentionally. 
For what reason, it's hard to say. Some people have speculated that maybe it was because Israel was trying to send a message to Western countries that like, look, we're not going to let this aid go through. We're going to continue with their genocide and there's nothing you or international law can do about it. That that seems to be true to me. Whether whether it changes anything, I mean, the, the problem here is that 30,000 or more civilians have died. And that 30,000 number comes from the Gaza Ministry of Health, which in December said it lost the ability to keep track of civilian deaths. So the number could actually be significantly larger by, uh, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of civilian deaths in Gaza. And that's not to mention the impending famine. Um, so the fact that the Western world, uh, you know, lost its mind over these seven uh, workers as compared to the 30,000 uh, or more Palestinians killed is, is quite hypocritical, but it could have also been intentional to show the world, as I said, that no matter what they say, no matter what they do, no matter what international law Israel violates, they're not going to stop. And it's coming to the point, in my opinion, that someone has to stop them. And whether that's Iran or uh, which has you know, significant tensions currently with Israel, uh, which maybe we can talk about a little bit, uh, or, or a conglomeration of countries just cutting Israel off is to be determined. But if Israel decides to go through this with this Rafa invasion, the global, not just in Palestine, but the global consequences will be catastrophic. I mean, we are talking World War III level consequences. So I think Israel is, is a mad dog who the U.S. needs to put back on a leash. Yeah, and so back to U.S. This all you know it trails back to U.S. politics, Ben. And uh, election year, we spoke about this before, and I didn't think it was quite. I didn't think it was possible, quite frankly, that this issue would ever um, have any impact on the U.S. election because uh, before October seventh, both parties were completely bought and paid for. The media was totally stumped. We had massacres in Janine uh, over this summer. Nobody was raising an eyebrow in the media. So everybody was exasperated, saying basically, this issue is going to die in the vine. Uh, APAC, the lobby, has bought the entire U.S. government. It's going nowhere, basically. And here we are. This is actually affecting the Democratic base in a significant way. It's not trivial. This is a significant way. The panic is absolutely uh, clear uh, in Washington. I myself, having just come back from D.C., having a number of conversations with uh, mostly Democrats because that's mostly what's in D.C., um, <laughs> and they've totally changed their tune on this after two months. And a lot of them, you could see they're just gingerly backpedaling so much on this issue. They realize they made a huge catastrophic misjudgment by supporting Joe Biden's uh, complete backing of Netanyahu on, after October 7th. They're now realizing this was a catastrophic error. So now you're having this come to Jesus moment, no pun intended, sorry, <laughs> come to Jesus moment uh, over the, uh, the the issue of Israel and Palestine um, in, in, in Washington now. And I don't think, I think the damage actually is permanent, Ben. I, I don't think that they can fix this. So what does this mean in terms of the alignment of uh, U.S. politics? Specifically, we're talking about the left. I got comments about the right, of course, but just your thoughts on, on that. Well, I'm hesitant, hesitantly hopeful uh, for a few reasons. And, you know, as you said, we've talked about how this ties in with the 2024 election. But my mind, and yes, there has been a change in rhetoric from Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Biden himself, and even Trump. Uh, and this is for numerous reasons uh, on the Republican end and the Democratic end. But it is in the in in the course of the 2024 elections and Biden does have to appease his progressive base, who is, in fact, viewing a genocide in real time. Uh, but I think of Erdogan in Turkey, who, uh, you know, had all this fiery, fiery rhetoric uh, targeted towards Israel. Uh, the local elections were lost by his party. 
And shortly after, uh, The Cradle, a, a fantastic news outlet, reported that he was looking to mend relations with Israel. So what we're in right now is really a critical opportunity, a critical moment and very unique, and it may not last forever. Right now, yes, Biden is appearing to dial back support for Israel, saying if you know the Rafah invasion happens, we'll have to rethink our policy, being very vague about that intentionally as sort of a, of a veiled threat towards Israel. At the same time, you have Ben Gavir, Itamar Ben Gavir, who is in Netanyahu's cabinet, the interior minister, threatening that, uh, you know, Netanyahu's presidency will be cut short if he doesn't go through with it. So Biden, I fully expect to return to his full blown support of the Zionist state of Israel as soon as the elections are over, much like Erdogan is attempting to do. Um, that being said, it's possible due to this unique moment in time that the Palestinians could get some concessions. In my view, one thing Biden could do to absolutely win the election would be to recognize a Palestinian state and see it actually materialize. Now, I do not support a two-state solution. I support a one-state solution. Uh, but the progressive base of Joe Biden wants a state for the Palestinians and just for the Palestinians. And if he has the powers to make that happen. Whether he takes that opportunity not, or not is to be determined. I think also right now we're seeing, uh, you know, it, by, it, Israel rather is in an extremely weak position. Uh, reportedly, they have promised not to target Iran or back Israel if Iran strikes Israel in retaliation for their the bombing of their embassy and consulate in Damascus. Uh, now, th it seems that Iran is preparing for war. The last day of Ramadan is tomorrow. They're activating missile defense systems throughout the country and have said that they are going to directly attack, uh, you know, probably uh, military targets. And this could absolutely cascade into a full-blown war. Uh, and if it does... Israel is going to have to contend with the Houthis who have said that they're going to send their navy and invade. You'll have to deal with Hezbollah in the north. The Iraqi resistance has targeted the Golan Heights. You've got Syria, of course, and you've got the Iraqi resistance also saying they're ready to arm something like 25,000 uh, Jordanian resistance members. Uh, the yeah. Houthis have said they're ready with 400,000 people. So, you, you know, you could see a complete full scale, all sides invasion of Israel before the 2024 election. So the situation is dire. We're in a, a pivotal moment in history. I don't think Israel has been this vulnerable in the full 75 years of its occupation. No, no, you're right. And uh, I'm going to quote uh, Trita Parsi here as a senior fellow at the uh, Institute for Responsible uh, Statecraft. Uh, he's uh, usually pretty accurate on these matters. And he's saying that Tehran has told the Biden administration that it will hit Israel directly unless unless Biden secures a ceasefire in Gaza. So a little bit of a, a quid pro quo going on there on the back channels. So this isn't this, you know. Ben, this should be done diplomatically um, over the table. By by this point, after six months, we shouldn't be having back channel threats and quid pro quo deals and unconfirmed statements and things like that. Unfortunately, that's what we're dealing with here. But what this does say is that Iran is basically attempting to set the pace of events um, from this point forward. And they, the door has been open for Iran to do that after Israel hit the Iranian embassy in Damascus really stepping over a major red line there in terms of international law and the Vienna conventions and so forth. So if uh, anybody has to, uh, you know, take responsibility and blame, be blamed for things going pear-shaped, it has to be once again Israel. So, I mean, at every, at, at every single turn, uh, they're going to have to cop some responsibility for the situation. But uh, never underestimate the media's ability for Israel to transform itself into a victim somehow so it will definitely spin it in this direction uh we're already seeing lots of headlines across the major news agencies israel braces itself for iranian attacks you see all these in the headlines 
not one of them, if if any, mention if they did it initially, they didn't. They eventually, they did, but initially, they did not mention that Israel hit an, an embassy, a diplomatic building that was left out of all the initial reporting. Now, after a week, you're starting to see it dribble in. So, but that's the important point of all this that should have been made from the beginning, and that would have shaped this, the trajectory of the news story. The media are so. They've got so much to answer for, Ben, uh, the mainstream media in their treatment of all of these events and issues every single time. It's almost like you can bank on the fact that they're going to omit something important or they're just going to completely misreport it. Uh, and then it sends everybody off on the wrong direction. Chaos ensues and the rest, unfortunately, is a footnote of history. Uh, ben Rubenstein, really appreciate you joining us here on TNT. It's been a fantastic discussion. Hope to catch up to you very soon. Thanks for having me, Patrick. It was fantastic. Keep up the good work. And before we go, Ben, give us a shout out to our, our audience of where they can uh, follow you and find your work. Absolutely. The best place to follow me is on X, formerly Twitter. <laughs> and that is at Ben F. Rubenstein. That's B-E-N, the letter F-R-U-B-I-N-S-T-E-I-N. And I've tagged Ben's account on my ex at 21 Wire for our show post today. So just click through there. You'll see it there on the Chiron just below. Follow Ben for updates and to be in the know on what's going on in the world. Thank you, Ben. Thank you to our audience for tuning in this first hour. We'll be back with more just after the top of the hour news headlines here on TNT. Today's News Talk. I'm Patrick Henningsen, your host. Stay with us. we got a lot more coming up. Basil Valentine, Brian Fail. Looking forward to it. Stay with us. Now I want to say this, and I'm going to say it just once. This is today's News Talk Radio, TNT. TNT.